थीम दैट वॉज बीन चोजन फॉर दिस इमृति डेमोक्रेसी फेडरलिज्म एंड इक्विटी द organizers and the the organizing committee has described these as the core elements of our constitution and indeed they are not only the core elements of our constitution but they are core to safeguarding the secular democratic character of the indian republic so these three elements are the ones in order to defend them we have been through a very big battle in the country and that battle has yielded some results not entirely to what our satisfaction but definitely it is a step forward where now the forces that can contain the abuse of these three important elements of our secular democratic republic and the destruction of these three elements they can now be challenged hopefully in the parliament in the coming days and that will be the continuation of this battle what the bjp and modi suffered in these elections is a big setback to this process of their destruction of the indian constitution and the character of our republic with the aim of replacing the secular democratic republic with a rabidly intolerant a poisonous hate filled authoritarian fascistic hindutva rashtra which is their political objective so this transformation that they are seeking in that there has been an advance now in terms of forces being emerging who are resisting this and that has to be strengthened in the future and that is something which i think all of us owe to comrade yms nambudipad on his birthday this year and that his uh, contribution to this very struggle from 1957 onwards part of the communist movement in kerala is of seminal importance to recollect but having said this these are elements uh, democracy equity and federalism that we have been campaigning all through as i said but then ems prithi has also has a tradition to go deeper into the conceptual aspects of these issues and what is the interlinkage between these three aspects which is what i would like to just spend a few minutes with all of you discussing the first point that all of us are aware of neither democracy nor the state are class neutral they can never be so how much of this democracy is will be available and what will be the real content of that democracy is it merely the right to vote in which case how is that vote influenced how are people equipped to make a reasoned choice of the alternatives that are there before them are they been equipped with that reasoning and rationality faculties through the education system that is provided by the state otherwise what is the role of money power and muscle power and the social stratification in our society that actually distorts the democratic choices based on a reasoned appeal and consideration now these elements of how much of the enriching of democracy can be done is again a product of the correlation of class forces at that point of time democracy is not the charity of the bourgeois rule it is actually the result of the struggles of the people demanding the rights to equality and today what do we see yesterday day before yesterday this week the entire rightward shift that has taken place in europe and the elections to the european union where the extreme right wing parties have actually gained and advanced what does this mean for democracy in the future now this is an element where we will have to link up this concept with each other Demo- democracy i mean today's world where international finance capital dictates and leads the process of neoliberalism in the world it's singular it has many attributes neoliberalism but its singular objective is the maximization of profits 
Now, maximization of profits, naturally it follows, may implies the intensification of exploitation of the people. Without that, profits cannot be maximized. Now, this maximization of profits is what has led to these obscene levels of inequality that you are finding today. Many authors like Piketty and Chancel, etc., they have brought out, and which is confirmed by international agencies, including imperialist agencies like the World Bank, which have said that in 2023, more than 700 million people have been pushed into poverty, which means they are living on less than $2.15 on a purchasing parity basis. 40% of these were out of the poverty line by 2019. Now they're back below. The burgeoning of billionaires, I'm not giving you data, but it's all available. But the burgeoning of billionaires on the one hand, and the impoverishment of the large mass of the people on the other, is the exact manifestation of this process of ma maximization of profits. Now, such a process of maximization of profits with such absolute cruel levels of impoverishment of the poor and pushing them into levels of very deep uh, poverty, that if that has to be sustained, then you require a political order that is able to permit such a process to take place, a political order that is able to control and that is able to confine the popular protests and discontent that grows out of this process of intensified exploitation. And that political order will have to be necessarily one that will not allow this popular discontent to reach the levels of posing <clears throat> a threat to the rule of capital itself. The rule of international finance capital, if that has to proceed and continue to maximize profits and continue to intensify exploitation of the people, then that political order is necessary for it to sustain this. Now, what would be such a political order? It will necessarily have to be a right-wing political order with attributes of authoritarianism, with attributes of coercion the people and controlling and in fact repressing popular struggles and against the exploitation that is intensifying. Now, the natural shift towards a rightward shift in politics is becomes a natural corollary of the process of profit maximization under neoliberalism. If this rightward shift, which we are seeing today all over, not only in the EU elections, from Brazil to Turkey, <coughs> to various regimes in the world, you got Orban, I mean, you've got very various examples on Gideon, including Modi in India. This rightward shift is in order to ensure that the popular struggles are not allowed to strengthen and also create legal impediments for such popular struggles to grow. And therefore, the rightward shift in politics is directly connected with this process of neoliberalism led by international finance capital. And this is also necessary, this rightward shift, for another reason. And that is that this popular discontent that is growing and naturally will grow against this intensification exploitation, it, A, at one level it needs to be contained through authoritarianism, if necessary through fascist, use of fascistic methods, or through a fascistic or a neo-fascistic order. And at the same time also, this popular discontent has to be diverted diverted in order to ensure that they are not united and become powerful people's struggles against the rule of capital. Now, this diversion is what defines also this rightward shift. In many countries, it's either racism, it is xenophobia, it is anti-immigrants, or like in India, which I'll come to a little later, it is directly 
co communalism as we know of it, religious strife, and utilizing that religious strife to divide the people. The same people who are united in their struggles against this intensification of exploitation now stand divided in the name of religion, in the name of race, in the name of color, in whatever be the name. But it is this diversion is also an element of this rightward shift. Therefore, you have direct authoritarianism, curtailment of democratic rights and the rights for popular protests. Second, diversion of the issues in order to disrupt the unity of the exploited classes, disrupt the unity, therefore they do not emerge to become a powerful, a powerful movement threatening the class rule of the finance capital. Now, in this situation, it is only natural that you will have the, I mean, horrific levels of income and economic inequality. Now, these four authors together, that is your Piketty, Chancel, Bharati and Somanji, have done a study where they have shown that the billionaire Raj under Modi in India is now more unequal than the British colonial Raj. And what they have estimated is that the top 1% of our population has an income share of 22.6% of the total income in the country and a wealth share of 40.1%. And the top 22 billionaires in our country, their income levels are equal to 77% of the people's earnings, of all the people's earnings. Now, this level of growth of inequalities, in fact, I would say obscene levels, is actually part of the process of profit maximization. And in India today, under Modi, what has been put in place has been a corporate communal nexus. And this corporate communal nexus seeks these reforms in order to further strengthen this process of profit maximization. And it is not only crony capitalism, but also the reforms that are put in place that promote the maximization of profits and the ideological campaign along with this saying that, like Modi exhorts all of us from the Red Fort on the Independence Day, saying wealth creators must be respected. Now, what is wealth? It is the monetization of value. And who produces value? It is the working people. Wealth creators being respected, but not the, the uh, working people who produce the value that is converted into wealth. That is a direct giveaway of the class outlook of, <coughs> of the current government and the regime that we have. And for this, you would have the entire process of privatization, the loot of our national assets in order that these profits are maximized, and also an integrated single market all over the country and apart from every other aspect the farm bills that were brought the agrarian laws that were brought which Modi was forced to withdraw in the face of the historic farmer struggle these agrarian bills were also one of the main design was to integrate Indian agriculture and the rural markets in order to benefit the profit maximization of international agribusiness and also your domestic big corporates. So therefore what we see is the curtailment of democracy goes along with the increases in inequality and these are connected with an order that the state has to create in order to for profit maximization under neoliberalism. Now this is one point that we remember, keep in mind. This, the other one that you talked of, federalism. The Smithy Organizing Committee, EMS Smithy Organizing Committee, talks of India's diversity, its plurality, 
and how federalism is integral to Indian democracy because of these differences. Correct. That is <clears throat> one aspect of it. But federalism is also an impediment for this process of profit maximization under neoliberalism. Because what is required is a unified India, I mean, market all over the country with no differences between what is there in one state or the other. So eliminating these differences means eliminating the rights of elected state governments, which is a direct assault on federalism. In addition, in India, the attacks against federalism become necessary for the, <coughs> for the ruling classes and particularly the Modi government, for the RSS for realization of its vision of a fascistic Hindutva Rashtra, that if a fascistic Hindutva Rashtra has to replace the secular democratic republic of India as defined in our constitution, then what is required is not a federal structure. What is required is the opposite of that a unitary structure. A unitary structure where you have centralized command. Centralized command in order to ensure that this, the political structure in our country will function from the centralized command. And that is why all the slogans of one nation, one election, one nation, one market, one, <coughs> I mean, apart from the ideological things, one nation, one culture, one language, apart from all the, these aspects, from the process of neoliberalism, this sort of unification of the country for profit maximization is a direct assault on federalism, which is happening. So therefore, the finally, the point that we have to understand is that the transformation of India into a into the RSS political project of a fascistic Hindutva Rashtra requires the replacement of fed, federal structure with a unitary state. And this unitary state is absolutely essential in order to advance the other attribute of profit maximization. And this profit maximization has a direct effect on democracy because for profit maximization you require a state structure that will assault democracy, democratic rights of the people and at the same time divert the attention of the people from becoming united against the exploitation under neoliberalism and by using all sorts of emotive issues which is happening globally but in India it's happening with a double whammy effect because it's not only the global neoliberal order, but it's also the internal objective of the RSS to transform the character of India. And when this is happening, the attacks on federalism is something that's very important to up, not merely oppose, but to fight back and to defend the entire concept of not merely federalism, but to uphold the equality of, uh, equality of the diversities that India has. Article 1 of the Constitution is very clear. India, that is Bharat, is a union of states. Without the states, there is no India. Now they want to remove the states and say India itself, and then states are only administrative structures to survive at the dictates of the center. So therefore, when we talk of democracy, equity and federalism, this is the actual challenge that's connected with the larger struggle in India of the Indian ruling classes completely being aligned with international finance capital and neoliberalism and therefore India becoming in terms of foreign policy and in other terms an appendage of US imperialism if, and that is one aspect of it. Domestically the consequence of that is greater curtailment of democracy, greater curtailment of democratic rights of the people, and the intensification of the rightward shift in politics, that is with the offensive of communalism and the process of this communal <coughs> offensives, which is reflected today in, in, in the recent elections. Once again, not a single Muslim candidate by the BJP all over the country. 
and it is reflected also in how the targeting and isolation of the minorities that takes place in our country and <clears throat> also against the, I mean, this will increase against the Christians as well. Who has been appointed by the BJP as the new Chief Minister of Orissa? The person who sat on a dharna demanding the release of Graham Staines, who was, uh, I mean, demanding the release of the murderer of Graham Staines and his children who were tossed in, the, in a car some years ago in Orissa. He is now the Chief Minister of Orissa. So the signals that have been given is that this rightward shift will rupture the social unity in our country and that rupturing is important for the creation of an authoritarian order, which is important for profit maximization and which in turn is also important <coughs> for the process to convert secular democratic India into a fascistic Hindutva rush. So this is the larger battle. So I think this is the battle that all of us will have to join. We are already part of it, but we have to of this that is taking place in today's conditions. And I'm sure that whatever be the political fallout of electoral results, etc., this is a larger social political process that all of us will have to engage ourselves in that to safeguard the secular democratic character of the Indian Republic, it is essential that these right-wing forces, particularly the fascistic communal offensive of the BJP RSS is further, further resisted and further weakened than what we have managed to weaken in the last elections. And that is an ongoing battle for us. So democracy, equity, federalism, not only core of our constitution, but they are core of what we call the idea of India, whether India will survive in this way or not. So in order to strengthen that, people's struggles are important. And I'm sure in the days to come, EMS Priti will continue to contribute and put forward, flag many of these issues,